Good morning to everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Nancy Walters. I'm the Executive Director of the La Jolla Community Center, and I can't tell you, first of all, how much we miss having you at the Community Center. It, is, it has just been um, really tough to, to not be able to see your smiling faces every day, but um, second of all, I'm super excited that we are able to host our Distinguished Speaker Series online, and our first speaker is Dr. Dilip Jesse. We're very excited about that. Thank you for your support and for your attendance. Um, and also a huge thank you to Judy White, who is our underwriter for this about the entire 2020 Distinguished Speaker Series. So we're very thankful for that. These have been very uncertain and challenging times for everyone, but we will get through this together. I want us to all continue to stay positive, stay active in mind. I would highly encourage you to visit our website. We have a variety of programs available for you, both live and on demand, varying from yoga to other programs, music appreciation and speaker series like today. Um, you can visit our website, it's ljcommunitycenter.org, and you can see all of our later on this week. Um, there are many programs, many more programs coming, including our next Distinguished Speaker Series, which is featuring Elaine Lillane, um, who at 94 will give, her, will give us her recipe for longevity, amongst other tips. So it will be a really fun um, speaker series then. So you can register online as well. Uh, so please stay tuned, stay in touch, and together we can get through this. I also want to mention that we have also just launched our spring fundraiser and your support is very important now more than ever. So please consider making a contribution to the community center so that we can continue to provide resources, programs. Thank you all for your continuous support. And for now, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Jill of Jesse. So I will go ahead and um, read you his very, very, um, long and accomplished bio. And if Dr. Jesse, if you can please just put up your slide um, and then I'll get going on your bio. Jayla B. Jesse, MD, is a Senior Associate Dean for Healthy Aging and Senior Care, Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry and Neurosciences, Estelle and Edgar Levi Memorial Chair in Aging, Director of the Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging at UC San Diego, and co-director of the UC San Diego IBM Center for Artificial Intelligence for Healthy Living. He obtained his medical education in Pune and psychiatry training in Mumbai, India. In the US, he completed psychiatry residency at Cornell and neurology residency at George Washington University. He was a research fellow and later chief of the units of on Movement Disorders and Dementias at the National Institute of Mental Health before joining UC San Diego. He started a geriatric psychiatry program from scratch at UC San Diego. Today, it is one of the largest geriatric psychiatry divisions in the world. Dr. Jesse has been principal investigator on a number of research and training grants. His main areas of research include psychophrenia, neuropsychiatric interventions, and successful aging. He published 12 books. 625 plus articles in peer reviewed journals and 140 plus invited book chapters. He is past president of the American Psychiatric Association, American Association for Geriatric Psychiatry, the West Coast College of Biological Psychiatry, and founding president of International College of Geriatric Psychoneuropharmacology. He is past editor in chief of the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry, and under his leadership, the journal grew from a modest impact quarterly to a monthly with the highest impact factor among all geriatric psychiatry journals internationally. He is currently editor in chief of International Psychogeriatrics. He was listed in the Best Doctors in America and in the Institute of Scientific Information list of the world's most high doctors comprising fewer than 0.5% of all publishing researchers of the previous two decades. Dr. Jesty has received many awards and honorary fellowships and was recently a TED Med speaker. His work has been cited in the Time, Atlantic, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, London Times, Public Radio International, NPR, various other national and international media outlets. Please welcome Dr. Dilip Jesty. Good morning. And thank you, Nancy, for a very kind introduction. 
Um, I want to thank the organizers of La Jolla Community Center for inviting me to give this talk. My wife and I have been residents of La Jolla for 30 years. And we have lived in La Jolla longer than any other uh, city in the world. And it's really a pleasure. We are all fortunate to be living in a place like La Jolla, even in the midst of um, the current pandemic. So I'm going to talk on loneliness, wisdom, and successful aging in the COVID-19 era. I want to first thank all my colleagues and staff and trainees who work with me and who make possible the work of the Stein Institute for Research and Aging, as well as the Center for Healthy Aging. Uh, Danielle Glorioso, he's, she's here next to me. She's the executive director of the center, and there are several other staff members and colleagues uh, whom you can see. Okay, so I'm going to start with loneliness. Next, I will discuss wisdom. And finally, I will talk about strategies for successful aging. What can we all do to age successfully? So talking about loneliness, the word loneliness did not exist in English language until 1800. This is according to a British historian, Faye Alberti. She said that the word that existed in English language till then was oneliness. So it's loneliness without the L. It's not just a word, it meant that until around 1800, people could be happy when they were by themselves. They were not distressed as they are when they are lonely. That L got added around 1800 with the beginning of the industrialization. So since then, progressively the society has changed all over the world. The families have become smaller, the mobility has increased a lot. At one time, people typically, wherever they were born, they studied there, they spent the rest of their lifetime. But now people are moving from one state to another, even from one country to another. Second factor was the popularity of the evolutionary biology, Darwin's survival of the fittest. So these have resulted in a change in the societal philosophy. We have moved away from the traditional paternalistic visions of a society in which everybody had a place and that is now being replaced with the new philosophy of individualism where everybody is responsible for themselves. Again, this has some pluses, but this also has minuses. And the minuses include increased level of stress. And I think that the stress has become even worse in the last three decades. Two main reasons for that are increasing globalization and the breakneck speed of advances in technology. Both globalization and technology have been immensely useful in some ways. But on the other hand, they have also produced more stress. Loneliness and social isolation. These terms are often used interchangeably. They are related, but they are not the same. Loneliness is subjective. It talks about how you feel. So it's a subjective distress because of a feeling of being alone. You want company, but you don't have it. That's how you feel. Social isolation, on the other hand, is objective. You can measure it by looking at the number of social relationships. The loneliness and isolation are different for individual people. I talked about loneliness that existed before 1800. It's also called positive solitude. It means that when you are alone, you don't have to be unhappy. 
you can use that time to self-reflect. You can use that time alone and enjoy something you want to do, such as reading. Or you can reach out to others during that time and you can open up your creative side. So there are lots of pluses when you are by yourself. Again, in these days of social distancing, I think many of us are experiencing that. So one may be happy while alone. On the other hand, one may feel lonely in a crowd. Think about college students who live in dorms. Each of them is surrounded by hundreds of other students. And yet, many college students feel very lonely. Loneliness is considered a grand challenge for the society. Again, especially during the last three decades. Loneliness is called a silent killer. It increases the odds of mortality by 30%. That's a huge number. Studies have shown that loneliness is as dangerous to health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, and it is more dangerous than mild or modest obesity. In the US, according to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, 162,000 deaths per year are attributable to loneliness. That is more than the number of deaths that are caused by lung cancer or stroke. Right now, we are going through the coronavirus pandemic and there are tens of thousands of deaths reported. However, this is over a relatively short period of time and hopefully when we develop vaccine, that mortality will go down. But loneliness has been causing these many deaths for nearly last three decades. In the UK, the Prime Minister there, Theresa May, two years ago, appointed a new Minister of Loneliness. And the reason for that was that the businesses in the UK were very concerned that the loneliness of the workers was affecting their productivity. And they were losing millions, billions of pounds because of loneliness. And that's why they started this Ministry of Loneliness. In the US, the average lifespan has been increasing continuously since 1950s. That is after the World War II. Every year it has been increasing until recently. In 2015-2016, and possibly 2017, where we have the latest figures available, the average lifespan actually has dropped. It has dropped for the first time in more than 50 years. And why has it dropped? Not because of stroke or cancer or heart disease. It dropped because of suicides, opioid abuse, and other things that are associated with loneliness and social isolation. So the ultimate cause is really loneliness, which is affecting our behavior and health. And older adults are obviously at a high risk of loneliness, but they are also at a high risk of COVID-19. As we all know, older people are at a higher risk of developing complications of COVID-19, high risk of getting hospitalized, needing ICU treatment, requiring ventilators, and more likely to die. The social distancing that is necessary to stem this pandemic is unfortunately having adverse effects, especially on older people. Why on older people? Because typically older people are less familiar with and have less access to technology. The children and grandchildren of the older people, they're very good at using FaceTime uh, and as well as social media like Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, and what have you. 
So the younger people can still maintain contact through these devices and social media, whereas most older people don't. Just a few words about what loneliness is. Loneliness is a trait. It's a personality trait like optimism and resilience, but on the opposite side. There was a genetic analysis of loneliness in the UK done in nearly half a million people. And it showed that loneliness is a modestly heritable trait. 37 to 55%, so about 50%. So that means half of loneliness is determined by genes, but that also means that half of loneliness is determined by behavior and environment, which means that we do have quite a bit of control over loneliness. The genes that are associated with loneliness are also associated with increased risk for heart disease, metabolic diseases like diabetes, psychiatric disorders like depression and dementia, and also high levels of triglyceride, low levels of the good cholesterol, HDL, which would result in greater obesity. So loneliness clearly has major health consequences, not only mental health consequences, but also physical health consequences and eventually mortality. What are the risk factors for loneliness? There have been many studies of these risk factors. I just want to show you one study. This was a study of 225 people in the community from age 50 to 68. And they all came from the Chicago Health, Aging and Social Relations Study. The main risk factors for loneliness were physical illnesses, chronic work-related stress or chronic social stress, small social network, and poor quality social relationships. And I think we can all see why this could be risk factors for loneliness. But there are also protective factors. And the two consistently shown protective factors are being married and having positive marital relationship. So either being married or having a partner, but having positive relationship is a, one of the best protective factors for loneliness. Centenarians, people who live to 100 and beyond. There's a nice study of 191 centenarians from New Zealand, they compared them with 73,000 older adults between 65 and 99. And they found that centenarians have 32% lower risk of loneliness compared to people between 65 and 99. So if you are between 65 and 99, all that you have to do is to live to 100 and beyond and the loneliness will go down. Non-lonely people were more likely to be living with others, having family support and not feeling depressed. So this is again consistent with what I showed in the last slide. As I mentioned, loneliness is associated with physical illnesses as well as mental illnesses. One of these is general general depression, major depression, and another one is generalized anxiety disorder. There's a large study in Ireland of more than 5,000 people over the age of 50. And they found that people who were more lonely and had greater social isolation at baseline were more likely to develop major depression or generalized anxiety disorder two years later. Even more concerning is the research that shows that loneliness increases the risk of developing dementia. This includes Alzheimer's disease, but also other kinds of dementia. 
This is a large English study in the UK of 6,677 people, older people who did not have dementia. And they were followed prospectively for six years. The researchers found that people who were more lonely at baseline were significantly more likely to develop dementia within the six years of follow-up. On the other hand, people who were married and had a number of close relationships were less likely to develop dementia. So time and again, we are seeing the same thing that people um, who are lonely are at a higher risk of multiple illnesses, but on the other hand, those who are married, have close social relationships, um, even having friends, even for people who are not married anymore, even that's very helpful. In San Diego, at University of California, San Diego, UCSD, we did a study of 340 people from age 25 to 98. And this was a community-based sample. These were not people with any specific illnesses. We used a scale that is commonly used to measure loneliness. And we found that even in San Diego, which we rightly call America's finest city, even here, a majority of the people in our study met the criteria for loneliness. And loneliness was common across all age groups, but it seemed to be highest in three periods, mid twenties, mid fifties and late eighties. However, there is the silver lining to all this research on loneliness, and I'm going to spend quite a bit of time now talking about that. One of our best findings was that wisdom was in the opposite direction as loneliness. In other words, people who had high levels of wisdom were not lonely and vice versa. And I will talk more about that in the next several slides. But before I do that, let me just talk about what wisdom is. Wisdom, we all know, is a religious and philosophical concept ever since the times immemorial. Practically every single religion and every single philosophy has wisdom in it. But scientific research on wisdom has been more recent. Why did we start doing research on wisdom? About 10 years ago, at UCSD Stein Institute for Research on Aging, we began a study called Successful Aging Evaluation or SAGE study. What we wanted to do was to evaluate all three domains of aging, physical, cognitive, and psychosocial. When people talk about aging, they mostly talk about physical aging but we also wanted to include brain aging and mental aging. So this was a randomly selected community-based sample and we use a specific design called structured multi-cohort longitudinal design. More than 2,500 phone users, home phone users in San Diego, ages 21 to 100 plus were recruited. We started with a phone interview in which we did the cognitive assessment and then we sent them a survey. It could be completed online or on a paper and pencil form. And we also wanted to study things like resilience, optimism, compassion, and wisdom. So I want to show you just one slide from this study. So we wanted to look at both physical health and mental health in these people. So this is the physical health from age 20 to nearly 100. And what you find is that, so if you look at this horizontal line at the bottom that shows the ages, people in 20 to 29 and 30 to 39, they have the best physical health. They're least likely to have any physical disability. But 
as we age, the physical health declines. That is normal. So most people in their 90s will have physical disabilities. So this finding is not surprising at all, right? That's what we would expect. The surprising finding was related to mental health or mental well-being. We assess this with several well-validated scales for mental well-being. And we found that it went exactly in the opposite direction as physical health. The mental health was worst in the 20s and 30s and was best in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And that came as a surprise to us. So how come older people were feeling happier than the younger ones? And that's what led us to think about wisdom. Because we talk about wisdom of aging, so we wanted to see if this reflected the wisdom of aging. So that's how we started the study. One other thing I should mention before going to wisdom is that very recently a study was published in the Journal of Abnormal Psychology. The study came from other researchers, not from our group. It was a large study of 600,000 people across the US and they looked at the level of distress, anxiety, worry, from age 18 through mid 70s, okay? And what they found was that the level of distress, anxiety, worry was highest when you are 18, 19, 20, 30s. But as you get older, distress, anxiety, worry, they all go down. And so that's exactly what we had reported in San Diego. Now this finding has been replicated actually across the country. So they said the question then came up about whether this reflected wisdom of aging. We are currently doing a collaborative study with uh, investigators from Italy. Uh, Dr. David Brenner, the Vice Chancellor of Health Sciences is leading this study on the UCSD side. And Dr. De Soma from University of Rome, La Sapienza is collaborating. So we have been studying people over the age of 90, as well as their relatives between 50 and 65. So we published a study of qualitative interviews of these people over the age of 90. And we asked them what is the secret of their success? That how come they were living so long and yet they seem to be pretty contented? And these are the codes by individual people. So one person said, I'm always thinking for the best. There's always a solution in life. Another said, I do not know what stress is. Imagine 95 year old person saying that. Life is what it is and it must be faced always. Third one was actually son of one of these nonagenarians. And the son said that my mother is a very strong and stubborn person. She's an agreeable woman, but she also tries to be dominant. Another said that my family has always been very close and we have always had so much faith in God. Pretty religious community, this one. And finally one um, said that my mother-in-law was a point of reference for us all. She worked very hard, she was an angel. So you can see this sort of positive traits in these nonagenarians that probably were helpful for their longevity. but how do we study wisdom? So when we started our research 15 years ago, we said the first thing we have to do as scientists is to define wisdom. The scientific research on wisdom started in the 1970s in the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, as well as at University of Southern California, USC and uh, Los Angeles. The good news is that the research on wisdom has been increasing by leaps and bounds. And these are all papers published in peer reviewed journals. Between 2010 and 2019, that's the last complete decade, 2000 papers on wisdom were published in scientific literature. So you can see 
that the literature is growing. So what we wanted to do was find out what definitions people had used to define wisdom. And we found that there were several commonalities. The first thing is to remember is that wisdom is much more than intelligence. We all know of some very intelligent people who are not wise, right? So wisdom is much more than intelligence. What is wisdom? It's a complex trait with multiple components. And I will talk about these components in the next slide. But this is important. Some of these components may increase with age. Intelligence quotient or IQ does not typically increase with age, but wisdom can and does increase with age, at least in some people. And wisdom enhances a person's well-being and also helps society's welfare. So I mentioned about the components of wisdom. So what are those components? The first is self-reflection. It is ability to look inwards. Think about our own behavior and actions. Then comes compassion or kindness. And this is compassion towards others, but also compassion toward oneself. Emotional regulation. Think about a teenager whose emotions fluctuate from hour to hour and minute to minute. And then think about a wise older person is pretty calm and has control over the emotion. Decisiveness amid uncertainty. It is important to accept the fact that we don't know really everything. We don't know many things. So we have to have some sense of uncertainty as well as accepting that there are diverse perspectives. And at the same time, we can't sit on the fence all the time. We have to be decisive when time calls for it. And finally, spirituality. Spirituality is different from religiosity. Spirituality means a belief in something that we don't see or hear or even know. So after talking about definition of wisdom, the next question is how do we measure it? There are several scales in the literature for measuring wisdom. Here at UCSD, we developed a new scale called San Diego Wisdom Scale or SDYs. This scale has 24 items, each to be rated on a one to five scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. We have shown that the scale has good to excellent psychometric properties, that is reliability, validity, and so on. And of the 24 items, let me just give you examples of two. One says that it is important that I understand the reasons for my actions. So here we are looking at ability to self-reflect. Second one is opposite of emotional regulation. It says, I have trouble thinking clearly when I'm upset. Wisdom is a trait, as I said, and all the personality traits are ultimately based in the brain. The question we had was, where in the brain would wisdom be localized? Of course, we realize that the brain is a very complex computer and there's no sort of simple division that this part of the brain does only one thing, another part does another thing. They, all of these parts work in unison. They are all related to each other. And yet, specific regions do have specific functions. So our literature review, as well as our own studies using magnetic resonance imaging, MRI and functional MRI and other uh, research tools showed that specific regions of the brain are involved in wisdom. And they include prefrontal cortex and the limbic striatum or amygdala. I don't want to go into technical details. If there are questions, I'll be happy to talk about them. So I mentioned that wisdom may increase with aging. 
are there data showing that well there are a number of studies actually that have compared older people with younger people and they have shown that older people are better than the youth in some areas of course there are other areas in which the younger people are better for example they have greater physical strength greater speed on the other hand older people are better in control of emotions in maintaining a positivity that is favoring positive emotions and positive memories experience based decision making as we age we acquire more experience and so we make more socially appropriate decision pro social behaviors like empathy and compassion things that we do for others rather than selfishly for ourselves and self reflection or insight ability to look inward so we'll see that several of the components of wisdom that i mentioned like self reflection pro social behaviors decision making emotional regulation they seem to increase with age again this doesn't happen in everybody there are some older people who are very unwise and some younger people who are wise but by and large with age and experience wisdom some components of wisdom tend to increase something that is even more exciting is called the grandmother hypothesis of wisdom studies in bottlenose dolphins killer whales and a species of bird called sechelis warblers as well as humans and both some ancient tribes as well as modern humans have shown a consistent finding they have shown that when grandma gm helps her adult daughter d in raising her children this adult daughter d lives longer is happier and produces more children than gm did plus there is greater happiness health and longevity in all three generations this is not feel good tv science that we see this is very hardcore science with papers being published in the highest ranking journals such as science and nature my colleagues ajit warki and his group have recently reported on what are called what they call grandparent genes certain variants of two genes apoe and cd33 are associated with better functioning heart and brain so people who have those variants of apoe and cd33 they will live longer and they will also have better functioning hearts and brains allowing them to transmit wisdom to the younger generations so they call them grandparent genes so it looks like there may be evolutionary basis for older people being wiser and that is how they are contributing to the species survival and thriving intergenerational activities have been shown to promote wisdom in numerous studies one study i want to talk about it's called experience score in this study some older adult volunteers who are retired from their jobs they were trained by researchers to be mentors and tutors for children and then they had to agree to spend at least 15 hours a week in public elementary schools as mentors and tutors and remember these were the kids who didn't have grandparents many of them even didn't have functioning parents so this older adults job was to teach them with the reading writing arithmetic but also with behavioral management so sort of wisdom of life the outcome was that after one year this was a randomized control trial by the way after one year the children who participated in the study their grades went through the roof and they were happier not a surprise 
But what is interesting was that the older people who volunteered and did this thing, their mental health and physical health improved and their biomarkers of stress and aging in blood and urine improved. The volume of the hippocampus, hippocampus is the area necessary for memory and that's the area that is most affected in Alzheimer's disease. The volume of the hippocampus on brain MRI was larger in these older people who participated in the study compared to those who did not. And this shows that wise parenting and grandparenting can be useful for both the generations. So finally, what can we all do ourselves to age successfully? So there are three pillars I recommend for this purpose. The first is healthy lifestyle, keeping your physical health, mental health, cognitive function, social health there. Second is social engagement, that is what it is, and wisdom. And let me now talk about each of these, healthy lifestyle, uh, social engagement, including purpose in life and then wisdom. How can we, what can we do? So the one thing I want to say is that the notion that brain only declines with aging, that it degenerates with aging, it shrinks with aging, is not entirely true. Sure, to some extent, there is degeneration of the brain with aging, however, in people, older people, who keep themselves physically, cognitively, and socially active, their brain continues to evolve in older age, and they make up for the loss of neurons and synapses by increasing the activity of the remaining neuron and even forming new neuron and synapses. And I will show you just one example of a study that was done by uh, Dr. Fred Gage at uh, Salk Institute and UCSD. <coughs> and this work has been replicated in multiple other studies in different species. In this particular study, what they did was that they took some old mice. Mice live for about three years. So two, two and a half year old mice are considered old. They divided them into two groups. One group on your left, you can see, so there were three or four such old mice in one cage. So that is how they are. If you go visit a research lab with mice, that's how you'll find them. Three, four in a cage. They are there 24 seven. They get their food, water and everything. And they really don't need to do anything. The other half of the mice, the researchers put them in what I call the Disneyland for mice. So that is huge open space. And there were roller coasters. There are things with different colors, almost like toys. And these mice could do whatever they wanted to. After three months, the mice who were in this Disneyland, where they have a lot of physical activity, cognitive activity, socialization, they had better brains than these mice in the usual cages. They, these mice in the Disneyland, they had more synapses, more blood vessels, and more neurons in their brain. Wow. So it clearly suggests that even in old age, if you keep the brain, mind, body active, the brain can continue to evolve. So what are the general strategies for a healthy aging? One is diet. Another is physical exercise, social engagement, sleep hygiene, and then healthcare. And let me talk about each of these in some detail. Talking about diet. The first thing is calorie restriction. In every single species, it has been shown that calorie restriction helps with health and longevity. Of course, we are not talking about such serious calorie restriction that it leads to malnourishment. We are not talking about that, but avoiding unnecessary calories. And this can be done through intermittent fasting with lots of water or just reducing portions of all meals. Mediterranean diet 
has been shown to be associated with better health. And Mediterranean diet includes green leafy vegetables, fruit, legumes, cereals, nuts, fish, olive oil, low fat or non fat milk, and low fat and non fat, -fat yogurt, multivitamins, especially B and E, and um, curcumin, uh, which is an Indian or Thai curry, is also supposed to be good. What about activities? Exercise is clearly very helpful. But what we have to remember is starting exercise is easy, maintaining is hard. So choose activities that are feasible and fun that you will be able to do almost every day. The formal recommendation is for 30 minutes of moderate exercise five times a week or vigorous exercise three times a week along with strength building activities two to three times a week. For cognitive activities, cognitively challenging, but not too stressful, leisure activities. Watching TV for hours is not cognitively challenging. Learning a new language, solving crossword puzzles, learning a new musical instrument, all of these are cognitively challenging activities, but so long as you enjoy them social engagement and social support. And for stress reduction, you can choose what you want to, uh, something that will make you relax. This can be music, meditation, or any other preferences. Tai Chi, yoga, and there are a bunch of other things that are, uh, uh, that have been found to be useful. Again, one thing won't work for everybody. So you need to find out what works for, best for you. And there's actually like a scientific research supporting the use of what are called mind-body activities. For example, research has shown that two month mindfulness-based stress reduction had a biological impact. It reduced the expression of genes that are associated with inflammation in circulating white blood cells. So in other words, the mindfulness actually reduce the inflammation at the cellular level. Daily meditation for six months, increase activity of telomerase. This is an enzyme that is associated with longevity. And on brain MRI, it seemed to increase the integrity of the white matter. So once again, so it is like, when you do these kinds of things, you're putting your brain on a treadmill. It's making your brain muscle strong. What about alcohol? Is red wine um, necessarily the best wine? Uh, and what about that resveratrol that is supposed to be useful? Actually, the research is not consistent. Um, there is now emerging work that suggests that almost any kind of ethanol may be useful. It doesn't need to be red wine, maybe even beer um, could be useful. Uh, and it's not clear exactly what part it is. Uh, it may not be resveratrol because beer doesn't contain that. Um, one question is then how much alcohol? The usual recommendation is for two glasses of wine, uh, maybe a bit more for men than uh, recommended for women. Uh, however, this is somewhat personal because drinking also has adverse effects on the functioning of the liver, for example. So if you are not a drinker, don't start drinking in older age just because it is good for you. On the other hand, if you have been drinking most of your lifetime, you can continue that, but in moderation. Excessive drinking is definitely bad for health and will reduce the longevity. Sleep. Nearly half of the older adults report sleep problems. One of the most common problems and for which there is no good treatment. We read all these ads about sleep medication, uh, 
And very few of them have been shown to be really effective over a long period of time without side effects. What is needed is what is called sleep hygiene. What is sleep hygiene? First is avoid caffeine, alcohol, or nicotine around bedtime. Secondly, have regular meals. A big dinner is not a great idea. And after dinner, it's good to have some light exercise, not heavy exercise, but just some light exercise. So the food can be digested before you go to bed. Regular bedtime, the time to go to bed and time to wake up in the morning. And these should be regular even on weekends. They recommend eight hours of sleep. Uh, the sleep amount goes down with age, although the sleep need is supposed to stay same. Calming bedtime routine. This is something actually I would stress strongly. No stimulating TV at bedtime. So these days don't watch any news uh, just before you fall asleep. You'll stay awake most of the night otherwise. Uh, and no other stressful task. Don't read some mystery novel, for example, at that time. Uh, dark, quiet, cool environment, no clocks. And remember, bed is for sleep only. Of course, you can use it for sex, but don't use it as a regular habit for reading, for example. Read in a chair, and when you go to bed, it is primarily to fall asleep. In the last few months, we are living in a different, in a different world. Things have really shifted dramatically. And so we are actually in the midst of two pandemics. The one pandemic talked about is loneliness for the last three decades with globalization, technology, increased risk of suicides, death, social isolation. And the other pandemic is of course now the COVID-19. And these two pandemics are quite different from each other. COVID-19 is caused by, it is acute, it's caused by a virus. So COVID-19 is a typical pandemic. The humanity has experienced pandemics of plague, cholera, typhoid, smallpox. We have had so many of these pandemics that have killed millions of people over centuries. But we have solutions for almost all of them eventually that we develop antivirus agents and vaccines. And that, that is how we have eliminated most of those pandemics. And hopefully we will do that with COVID-19 within a few months. Uh, hopefully it'll take um, less than a year. The loneliness pandemic on the other hand is different. It is not caused by infection. It is not acute, it is chronic, and it is behavioral. So we cannot develop a vaccine to treat loneliness. We need behavioral vaccine rather than some medication or something that is injectable. So what we need are individual wisdom-based interventions as well as societal wisdom. The question that comes in is, can, can you really increase wisdom? Can you really increase resilience? And the answer is actually yes. We just published a study uh, done at UCSD, which was a one month behavioral intervention, which was administered by unlicensed residential staff in five retirement communities in three states, California, Arizona, and Illinois. We, the intervention included savoring engagement in activities that are value-based. For example, if you like working, volunteering in the community, that becomes important for you. Keeping a gratitude diary in which you write every day before you fall asleep, a couple of things that make you feel grateful and happy. And finally, homework. Not doing exercise or some activity once a week for one hour, but practice it every day. And we found with this study that there was significant improvement in resilience, wisdom, and the stress level went down. So the long and short of this is that wisdom and resilience can be increased if we do the right thing. One other thing to add here is the purpose in life. 
This becomes especially, I mean, this is important at all ages, but especially in older age. Dr. Frankel, uh, who survived the Holocaust, uh, he said this beautifully. He said that those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Number of studies have shown that purpose in life is not just good for mental health. It is very good for physical health and even longevity. One study showed that purpose in life was associated with lower risk of developing age-related psychomotor slowing. This is something that happens almost universally as we get older. Our brain and mind as well as body slow down. And the study showed that purpose in life, those people who had better purpose in life actually had lower slowing than others. And we published a study just last year about purpose in life. And we found that this sense of purpose in life plays an important role in maintaining physical function and mental function, especially among older adults. Finally, if a few words about practical wisdom, what can we do at individual level in increasing the components of wisdom? Because we are not talking about theoretical wisdom, we are talking about practical wisdom, something we can practice. And that can happen only if we form a habit of making wise decisions in daily life. When you talk about stress, most people think about some big stress, like loss of a loved one, or tsunami, or this uh, COVID-19. Those are, of course, major stresses. But equally important are minor stresses that accumulate. For example, getting late to an appointment, getting caught in a traffic jam, having an argument with a friend, all of those stresses add up and they affect health. So what we need are wise decisions that involve self-reflection, emotional regulation with positivity, empathy and compassion, decisiveness amid uncertainty, and spirituality. It's exactly the components of wisdom that I described over here. And the first step in the process of becoming wiser is honest self-reflection. So think about which components you are strong in. For example, you may be strong in self-reflection, but compassion may not be your biggest strength. On the other hand, for some other people, it could be just opposite. But then whatever we are weak in, we can try to increase that. One example I like to give is um, road rage and emotional regulation. You know, you're driving fast because you're late to uh, an appointment and somebody cuts in front of you and you're so upset, so mad that you start cursing, honking, uh, chasing that other car. How do you control that? The first is what is called cognitive reappraisal or rationalization. Make a deliberate effort to interpret the meaning of what happened. So why did the driver cut in front of you? Maybe the driver actually had a child in the back seat and the child suddenly became sick, started throwing up or had a seizure. If you were driving that car, would you not rush? So if you think about some such interpretation of why the other person may have cut in front of you, that would make you calmer. Second is distraction. Change the focus of your attention. Don't think about the fact that somebody passed you. Think about some music that you like. Increase the volume of the radio if you're listening to some nice music, for example. And labeling. Agree with, accept the fact that you are angry and say that is okay. I mean, you have a justification in being angry, but let's move on. Think about something else. We talk, we all know about compassion, which is kindness to others. But it's equally important to be kind to ourselves. Often we find that people who are compassionate toward others may be overly self-critical. 
that you blame yourself for everything that goes wrong. So the way out of that is think about how you would handle a friend who came to you who was stressed out and he was blaming himself or herself. Well, ask that person not to be self-critical because this happens to everybody. And you can, again, get over it. So same kind of attitude you should have toward yourself. So until now, I've been talking about the things that we all can do at individual level, right? What we can do in terms of physical activity, uh, cognitive activity, socialization, intergenerational activity, um, having a purpose in life, controlling emotion, self-reflection, self-compassion, right? But now let us think about from the societal perspective. Because what I have been talking about is loneliness as a pandemic that is affecting the whole society, that is bringing down the average lifespan, causing so much increase in stress that is affecting physical health. So we need changes not at individual level only, but at the societal level. The increase in globalization and in incredibly rapid advances in technology are upending long held social mores and causing modern behavioral pandemics of loneliness, opioid abuse and suicide. For example, the rates of suicides are going up in all age groups, starting as early as age 10. So sad. Um, so, so those are the things where we all need to do work together and do something. So what is needed is wisdom. That means compassion, self-reflection, emotional regulation, accepting diversity and spirituality at individual and societal level. That will bring down the level of stress that we all feel that will reduce loneliness, that will improve health and the lifespan will keep on increasing them. Where do we start? We actually need to start in schools. We need to start in kindergarten and then going to elementary school, secondary school, high school, colleges, uh, even professional schools like medical, medical, law, engineering schools. Because if you think about it, what we teach in our schools are hard skills. In the elementary, secondary, high school, we teach the kids the three R's reading, writing, and arithmetic. In professional schools, we teach what is needed to be a competent professional. For example, in medical schools, the students are taught how to be the best at diagnosing diseases, how to be best at treating them. That is of course important, that's a physician's job. But is that enough? for having a meaningful and happy life? I don't think so. We need something more. We need to lower our level of stress. We need to be enjoying what we do. And that's where things like compassion, including self-compassion, emotional regulation, self-reflection come into play. We need to teach those things to our kids starting at a very young age. I want to end this talk on a positive note, uh, starting about loneliness and all of these other things and then COVID-19. And yet, there are some inspiring examples of older people who should make us feel very good about aging. You all know that COVID-19 is especially problematic for older people. Older people have a much higher risk of having severe complications, much higher risk of getting hospitalized, going to ICU, being on a ventilator and dying. However, there are some older people, very old people who developed COVID-19 and yet came out of that with flying colors. So far, I have seen reports of 11 centenarians, people over the age of 100, from China, Italy, Iran, UK, and US, who developed COVID-19 and survived. One of them is Bill Lapskis, a World War II 
US Army veteran from Lebanon, Oregon. And this is the title of the story. He beat coronavirus to celebrate his 104th birthday. Uh, he was actually in the hospital at the time and everybody celebrated his 104th birthday. Now he's out of the hospital. Not to be outdone is Connie Tichan, 106 year old, former sales assistant from Birmingham, England. She also recovered from COVID-19 and she's now back home. Um, her daughter said that Connie still cooks, but enjoys an occasional trip to McDonald's. So aging of the population is not a silver tsunami as it is disparagingly dubbed and which I st very strongly disagree with. I think aging of the population can be a golden way of happy, healthy, active, and wise seniors if, if the society helps the seniors. So that's the message for everybody. Thank you all for your attention and uh, I'll appreciate uh, if there are any questions that I can answer, but also later on, feel free to email me with uh, any thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Justy. The information hit so close to home um, it, and is so relevant to the current climate. So thank you for that. Uh, we do have several questions that have come in and some of the attendees had to leave. However, we are recording, so they will be able to get your answers after this. So a question from Steven um, says, I've just turned 65. I've been living on my own since 2007. There's dementia in my family history. I'm not married, but have lots of friends, but only one in San Diego. I do have lots of acquaintances. I'm not lonely. I can hardly sleep up with my to-do list. I can, I can hardly keep up with my to-do list, uh, even during COVID. The issue is I'm a cancer survivor and thus tired a great deal. I prefer to lay down when I'm doing things like this um, now. Any thoughts on my situation? First of all, I want to congratulate you on being so active socially. I'm delighted to hear that you have so many things to do. Uh, that, that is wonderful. That, that's really how um, one should be. So that's great. Um, you know, we can, so the, my suggestion would be to follow uh, usual guidelines for keeping healthy lifestyle. Uh, understand um, being a cancer survivor, the high risk of dementia, and yet you can do quite well. Even though there is a family history of dementia, that doesn't mean that everyone in the family will develop dementia. Actually, everyone will not. Only a small number of people will develop dementia. And the things you can do are those that are under your control, right? So uh, keep yourself physically, cognitively, socially active. Uh, and clearly you already have this positive attitude and socialization. Uh, so appropriate nutrition, keeping that is uh, helpful, uh, getting good night's sleep. Um, but it looks like you already are doing most of the things that are recommended. And so just keep on with those. Thank you. Uh, Barbara asks, it seems that when one is lonely, the first instinct is to reach out to others, but according to your research, it seems it is a balance between external social action and doing the work of oneself to develop wisdom. Can you address understanding the balance here? In other words, just reaching out will not solve the problem of loneliness. That's, that's a great question, and it's a very thoughtful question. Uh, I agree with you 100% on that, that loneliness and social isolation, I said they are related but not same. The problem with loneliness is that you feel lonely, even though you may not be lonely in the sense that you may feel lonely in a crowd. So somebody surrounded by hundreds of people and yet feels lonely. On the other hand, somebody in a cave may not feel lonely. So it is indeed accepting the fact that it is okay to be by yourself. There are things you can do when you are by yourself that are harder to do when you are surrounded by others. For example, like to read something, uh, or if you want to watch your favorite old movie or listen to you, your favorite music, you can't necessarily do that with other people, right? 
So do those things at the same time, we do need some socialization. How much socialization one needs is entirely individualistic. There are some people who are perfectly happy having just one or two close friends. That's it, they don't want any more. On the other hand, there are some people who need at least 15 close relationships to not feel lonely. So it's a question of finding out what works best for you. You know, one size does not fit all. So if you, through self-reflection, think about the times when you felt very lonely and think about times when you did not feel lonely and what were the contexts for those two times? Something like that will help you sort of follow the strategies to make you feel less lonely when you're feeling that way. Thank you. Another question from Denise says, on the paradox of aging slide, is there a relationship, casual or correlational? Um, I, I assume that the question is whether there is a relationship between physical well-being and mental well-being. Um, the answer is actually no. There is no clear relationship between physical and mental well-being. People who are perfectly healthy physically can be quite depressed, anxious, maybe even suicidal. On the other hand, person who is in a wheelchair, person who has stage four cancer can still be quite contented happy. So there is no relationship between physical and mental health. Of course, if the physical health is, physical illness is something that is causing severe pain, clearly that will affect the mental functioning. But by and large, you have much more control over your mental health than you have over your physical health. Thank you. Another question from Barbara says, can you discuss the effect of pet ownership and connection to nature on reducing loneliness? And th that's a very nice question about pet ownership and nature. Uh, again, it is subjective, but there are a number of studies that have shown that pet ownership is very helpful, especially for older people who may not have any companion or have only one companion and they're feeling lonely, the pets can be great companions. Um, I mean, the only downside about having pets is that the pets also get old. Uh, and so their health and their longevity can have an impact. Uh, nonetheless, it is very rewarding uh, because you get unconditional love from your pets. Um, Regarding nature, yeah, there is no problem there at all. I mean, you can always visit nature and that it becomes almost a part of spirituality where you go beyond humanity and look for other sources of relaxation, comfort, relationship. Um, and so any fondness for nature, again, we live in beautiful La Jolla with uh, you know, beautiful beaches and not too far away are mountains. Uh, so definitely enjoying the nature is an important part of wellness. Okay, I believe um, if anybody else has a um, last minute question, just please raise your hand and we'll be able to see it. But um, as of now, there's not another. So I just wanna thank you again, Dr. Justy, you were fantastic. We were very lucky to have you speak to the community and we all have to make an effort to stay connected and stay active and of course stay positive. And um, before we let you go, Dr. Jesse, is there anything you would like to tell us about an upcoming book perhaps or any way to contact you? Well, thank you. Yeah, so we'll be, I will be publishing a book called Wiser uh, and it is, um, it will be published by Sounds True. Uh, this is a book about the science of wisdom based on the research, mainly the research that we have done here at UCSD, but also partly also done research done by others. Uh, and Scott Luffy, who is the director of communications, he's uh, my co-author on this book. Um, the book will be coming out later in this year, and it is meant for general public. 
it is not meant for only scientists. And the goal is to convey the ways in which we can all become wiser at any age. Wisdom increases with aging, but younger people can become wiser too. And older people, definitely we always have an opportunity to become even wiser than what we are. Because I think that wisdom is really essential now for reducing loneliness, reducing stress in other ways for ourselves and for the society as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Justy. So just again, a quick, a quick reminder to anyone who is still listening, uh, just please feel free to reach out if you need anything from us. We are available through the phone or through our website. Of course, email, just uh, please reach out. You can visit our website. It's ljcommunitycenter.org. Just fill in the, the Stay Connected um, page. There's a form there to just reach out. And um, we're happy to be in touch. And everybody, just please be well, um, stay safe, and we hope to see you very soon. Thank you again, Dr. Justy. Thank you.